So about today's project, we are excited to have Patricia Chamberlain from Bayside Council on board today. She will share the work her team has been trialling in council dog parks using worm farms to digest dog poo. Trish is the coordinator for waste avoidance and resource recovery at Bayside Council Southern Sydney. Trish has been in her current role for five years, looking at ways to improve resource recovery and community waste behavior. She has over 21 years of experience working with government, community and industry in this field. Welcome and over to you, Trish. Thanks, Ruth, and thank you so much uh, to the Enviro Pet Network for um, letting me present today on our project. Uh, it's really exciting to be here, especially with it being your inaugural um, webinar series, I think. Yeah. And thanks to Ruth for um, help all the organising and stuff as well. So Bayside Council as well. We'd like to pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the land, elders past, present and emerging, on which this presentation takes place and acknowledges the Gadigal and Bidjigal clans of the Aora Nation. So when we started this project, the only system that we had for dog poo disposal in off-leash dog parks was a standard litter bin service. So we had our red littered litter bins, some of them were within stainless steel cages, and we also provided um, dog poo bags for residents and customers and to use. Some of the issues with this program were that there was some odour. You can see um, in the bin on the, not in this bin, but on the bin on the previous slide, it actually has an open lid. So there was odour in those ones where the lids were open. We weren't getting any organic recovery. Unfortunately, the litter bin waste goes straight to landfill. We weren't offering any encouragement for the community to recycle. And council litter bin staff were collecting and were complaining about the smell when they collected the litter bins because of the dog poo. So the what we decided to do is we wanted to find a system where we could actually process the organic um, dog poo. So the objectives were to reduce odour, to increase organic recycling, to showcase systems that could be used in households and homes as well, and to reduce the number of times that the litter bins needed to be collected. It was a partnership with councils, parks and open spaces who um, maintain the parks and also maintain the dog poo bag dispensers. For the first part of the trial, we decided because we hadn't been in this space before that we were going to use a tool that was already available on the market, which was a tumbleweed pet poo converter. This is a worm farm, which we started installing in some of our off-leash dog parks from July 2019. The top part of the bin is above the surface. This is where we put the worms and the dog poo. And then there's ground level and underneath it, it actually, the bin actually goes into ground level so that when the worms start producing their um, castings, those castings can actually flow out into the surrounding soil and, nutri and provide nutrients to the soil. There's a, pet, there's a foot pedal with this um, type of bin as well so that residents didn't have to touch the bin when they were using it. So we installed 10 of these um, bins in our off-leash dog parks starting from July 2019. It was very important that we kept the red littered bin there because we wanted to have people to have the option that if you don't want, if you don't have the proper stuff to put in our recycling bin, you can still put it in the red litter bin. Uh, we put signage on the bin saying it was for dog poo only, no rubbish or plastic bags, and please only use the biodegradable cornstarch bags supplied by council. The reason for this is because there are other, well, it actually turns out that in the end, we actually moved away from those cornstarch bags because even though they are compostable and they do compost under the right situations, they're very robust and our worms were having trouble actually breaking through them to eat the poo. 
So in the dispenser there, you can see that there's a green bag. That was a second compostable bag that we trialled. It's quite thin and it did degrade better and was better for the worms. So trials started, like I said, in July 2019. So over a year later, we, we did see healthy decomposition of the bags in the dog poos, and we saw that the worms were alive and thriving. The only thing that we gave these worms in terms of food was the dog poo. So they weren't eating anything else in there except potentially the bags. So it shows that they do actually like it and that they can thrive in that environment. And then again, we looked at one of our other bins in 2021, which was almost two years into the program and the the worms are still going great. In terms of how long it takes to digest, these systems were built for um, household use where you'd only be providing dog poo from, you know, one to three or four dogs every day, not the hundreds of people that we see every week in our, dog, in our um, off-leash dog pups. So one of the bins that was, um, was closed in about May 2021 and it was completely full to the brim when we closed it. And after about five to six months, it had dropped to about three quarters full. So it is, it is the worms are taking a long time to digest the amount of food that we've given them. We do anticipate that in about, in about a 12 month period, so about mid 2022, that most of the dog poo in that bin, which is sealed now, and we're not adding new stuff to it, will have decomposed into just soil, worms and the castings. At that stage, we can use the castings in one of our um, new um, facilities that I'm going to show you later, and we can start again. One of the issues that we found in this trial was that there is a lot of contamination. In this first phase of the trial, there was contamination with about 25% of the bins, which is a lot, which required a lot of maintenance by our team to actually remove the contamination so that this, the worms could stay healthy. One of the things that people were putting in was incorrect bags. That shows that these people actually want to do the right thing. They want to recycle their dog poo, but there are they just haven't understood the message that only certain types of bags are going to work in our system. It's still good news that people actually want to use these bins. Unfortunately, there was contamination with other items as well. I might like, have some here. Sorry? There was um, contamination with other items like bottles, raw chicken, food packaging, coffee cups, snack hose packaging, nappies and cigarette butts. So why is there so much contamination? So we had, to, we had to unpack this and try and work out why this was happening. One of the reasons is because people just weren't reading the sign. When um, my senior officer who maintains the bins talked to people in the park, they're like, oh, I just saw a bin. I just put stuff in. I didn't even see the sign. Uh, it is made worse if the red littered bin, which is for general rubbish, is full because then people say, well, I've got no option. I have to put it. It's better to put it in a bin than put it on the ground. The other thing with this first phase is that the actual compo worm, composting worm farm system, it looks like a bin. People see a bin and they go, oh, okay, that's a bin for rubbish. Um, sometimes the dispensers do run out. Um, people use them very frequently. We did have to actually lock the dispensers as well because some people think I'll just take the whole roll home and then I won't run out. Uh, and that when those, there aren't any um, bags left, that's when people say, oh, well, I'll use my own bags and they, put them in there in the bin and they can't be broken down by the worms. The other thing is that the foot pedal, which was installed to provide convenience to householders, actually gives um, customers or people in our parks an incentive to use the dog poo bin over the red bin. Because with the red bin, they have to actually lift up the lid, whereas this one they can go and put their rubbish in and not touch anything. So unfortunately, we're making it a bit too convenient for everybody, and that was causing some of our contamination as well. There were some other issues. You can see up the top left that um, if for some reason we couldn't get to the bin every few days or twice a week, there were some bins that were just completely filling up. Um, you can see with that, there's only a couple of bins, a couple of bags that aren't our green ones. So they're actually filling up with proper food. Um, and because of that, you can see in the second one that we've had to tape it down, say out of service and saying that it's closed tempor temporarily while our worms digest 
the material, please use the garbage bin instead. Uh, and sometimes we also had to take them up for maintenance because as I said, that because of the contamination, people using them so much, if we didn't attend to them at least weekly, we would have problems with overflowing. And sometimes if our officer was off, we had to close them because we wouldn't have somebody to maintain the bin. One of the things we also found, which wouldn't be a problem in household use for this, is that the lids were falling off because people were pushing them up and down so rapid, so often. In a household situation, you might lift up the lid a few times a day. Um, in this situation, it was being lifted up a lot more than that, and that was causing more wear and tear than you'd expect in a household system. The time for the maintaining the bins, the 10 bins, was about four hours per week, which is a long time commitment for our officer. And when we actually closed up the bins for a six month period to help the things digest, um, we were surprised, we should have probably known, but there's a lot of microbes in that material, um, the dog poo material that spiders like as well. So when we left it closed for a long period of time, the spiders took the opportunity to make their home in there as well, where they had a healthy food source. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't happen, it didn't happen when the bins were open because people were using it all the time and the spiders didn't like that. Um, but if it was ever, if you ever had a bin that was closed for a long period of time, just wear gloves and make sure that there aren't any spiders there before you put your hands near it. So we thought, how can we how can we make this system better? Because obviously it seemed like it was a it's a great system. It's a great system that could work with in a household where you've got less, less material and you don't have to worry about contamination because you're managing it yourself. Um, but it just didn't cope with the volume of dog poo that we had. So we thought, let's go to a larger system. Again, we, we found a system on the market called Subpod, which is already ready designed and seemed to be very good for the purposes that we wanted. It's larger. It's actually, the pods are actually set within a garbage bed, bed so it looks really beautiful. It doesn't look like a bin, so you aren't going to get people to go, oh, there's a bin, I'll put my rubbish in it. The only modif one of the only modifications we made is we removed the hinge that's designed to keep the lid open. Because this isn't just for dog poo, it's um, designed for other organic materials like food, there could be household situations where you wanted to keep the lid open for a prolonged period of time. We don't want that to happen because of the odour issues in our parks. So this is what they look like. It's a kind of a flat back pack system. It took um, two of our officers probably a good day to put everything together, but that included both bringing over the soil to the park, bringing over the sub to the park, and also bringing over the plants. We chose Australian plants that were, didn't lead a lot of maintenance, that could be self-sufficient, and also didn't have any spiky ends, so that when people were putting their hands near the sub pod, they weren't getting um, spiked by anything. What we've done is we've put four sub pods together in every park. We've installed them in four parks so far, and each of those four parks has four sub pods. The reason we've done this is so that we can have one sub pod open while the other three are digesting. So we don't have that problem in the first system where we just had the bins closed, now you've got to use the garbage bin. We've got this bin is closed because we're giving the worms time to digest, but you've got another one you can use, and there's another two that are available later on. The ones that we um, didn't want them using, we um, either said full worm farm, or we said um, under maintenance and we lock things. So there was less um, chance that residents would actually get into it. And they do look really beautiful. So then we added the worms. In, in this picture, you can just see that the worms have a little bit of cardboard to help them um, settle in and give them something to eat. The settling in period is usually about two weeks um, for the first pod, just to give them time to get acclimatised to the new system we've put them in. So the rotation I was just talked about. So there's a worm farm full. The worms are busily digesting dog poo. This means the worm farm is full. Please use an alternative dog poo recycling bin or use the nearest garbage bin. That's just in case there's a um, scenario in the future where all of them have to be closed for digestion. What we're working on at the moment is rotating one pod a week. So we don't have one pod where all the worms are overwhelmed by the amount of food and then have other ones where the worms got no food at all. 
And we've also put in some new signage as well. Before we just had signage on the actual um, dispensers and on the bins themselves. Now we've got a big sign with a lovely looking garden so people can come over and go, oh, this is what they're actually doing and this is what the intention is. And because it doesn't look like a bin, people don't wander over there with their chip packets and say, this looks like a good place to put my chip packet. So we've only been running this system since 2019. We, I mean, so 2021. So yeah, we've put, um, so it's only been two months. Um, we've put in four sub pods and we're intending to put them in all the off leash dog parks, but um, we ran out of time before Christmas. You can see even within that small period of time that the bags are breaking down and the worms are in there and they're happy. Uh, the picture on the right just gives you an idea about recently added bags and the way the bags start to decompose when they've been in there for a bit longer. It's been really great in terms of contamination. We're still getting about 10% contamination, but all the, pretty much all the contamination we're getting is the wrong type of dog poo bags now. So we still need to do some, um, some education around that. We need to get better at making sure the dispensers don't Get empty out because if these dispensers are empty, people have more incentive to use their own bags. But there have been situations where the dispensers full and there's still the wrong type of bag. So if people think, I don't want to waste this bag I've already got, I'm sure it's going to work. Um, but if you, if you see the top one, top left, that's one of our sub pods with a huge amount of dog poo in it and absolutely no contamination. So um, that is a very rare site for the other, for the phase one bins. So, yeah, people are trying to do the right thing. They know what the bin's for, and it's just that education and messaging around the bags that we need to work on. One of the things that these are just um, design things that wouldn't be as much of a um, problem in a home system. Because we didn't want people to leave the worm farms open, we, as I said before, we removed that um, part of the worm farm that allowed you to leave the, the lid open. As a result of that, some of the lids were flipping back much further than the manufacturer intended them to, and that was snapping some of the lids off. So we've done a fairly rudimentary, but it's a very effective system where we've added wooden stakes so that when somebody lifts the lid, that's as far as they can go. We also locked them to prevent use when we didn't want to. Um, also, the handles on the sub pod weren't galvanised. I guess they weren't... Some, I guess if you, they weren't anticipated that you put them in somewhere where there's a lot of water and rain. So we just had to replace them with galvanised screws, which wasn't a really big issue. Um, the only operational issue we've actually found with the worm farm so far, which is bottom right, is that close up is actually a picture outside the pod in the garden bed. So what happened is we went to one of the sub pods one day and all of the worms had decided they liked the garden bed better than they liked the sub pod. There was two reasons why that might have happened. One was because they just, it was before it had been open to the public. So they only had their cardboard and the other starter materials to eat. And maybe the stuff that we put in the garden bed was tastier. Maybe that wouldn't have happened if there was dog poo in there. The other thing is that the sub pod was quite dry. So what we're, and they like a wet environment. So it, you know, we were happy to see that the worms weren't damaged. They were still alive and healthy. They just weren't, in the sub pod where we wanted them to be so they could do their, their recycling work. So with the watering of the sub pods plus the rotation, we probably are spending about the same amount of time in the maintenance, about four hours per week. But the difference is because we're getting less um, sort of harmful contamination like um, packaging and dead chickens and that sort of thing in it, um, if, if one of my officers is on leave or is sick and it's two weeks before they can get back to it, the sub pod will still be functioning. Um, there will still be space in the sub pod because it's larger and there won't be any serious contamination. So it's a, it, it's a system that allows us a lot more flexibility. Also, if we actually make the conditions within the sub pod better, even if we don't water them one week and the worms decide to move out, if we make the sub pod nice and healthy for them again, maybe they'll move back in when they run out of food in the garden bed. So the, so the findings were that there is healthy worm activity and decomposition seen in both systems, which is great. Um, there would, 
where my um, senior officer, who is our composting and work farm expert, thinks that they would be great for home use. He also uses a different type of worm farm for his own dogs at home, and he said it's working perfectly. So it is known that worm farms are successful in home environments. Um, yeah, the type of bag is really important. Yeah, outside the back door. The bags isn't as much an issue if you're doing it at home because you can probably just use a shovel. But um, obviously, the bags are very important when you're using them in the park. So we tried two types, and we found one that works really great, and we switched to that. Like I said, maintenance is still required, but there's less contamination, there's less overflow, so more flexibility. It's still really early days yet. Phase two was only installed a couple of months ago, and we need to see if we can keep the worms can keep up with the volume of dog poo. We've put about a thousand, I think it's about a thousand worms per sub pod. And with the um, first worm farm, the first phase, we put a thousand to start with. And then after about six hours, about after about six months, we added another thousand to help them keep up with the more than anticipated volume. Um, phase two does give the worms the option to migrate if the if the conditions aren't are unfavorable. In the first system, um, the worms can't really get out of the worm farm, so they stay in there and they're happy. They're all there still, um, but they don't have a chance to go and you know find a better real estate like they do in the sub pod. And the contamination was significantly reduced in phase two. So how's the child being received by our community? We did posts when we first started the system and we got some great response. And then we did another post um, last month. People saying, this is a great idea. This is fantastic. This is my senior officer, um, Jeff, who maintains the bin. He said when he comes into the park, all these dog owners rush up and ask him questions about it. And they're, I think it's like the network and, you know, what I've heard from Ruth as well. People who own pets are really interested in seeing um, less waste from, you know, from their um, pets. And so they, they love this program. So it's a program that has a lot of community appeal as well. That dog poo um, recycling dispenser on the top right, that's actually a article in the St George and Sutherland Shire Leader in July 2019. There was also a article in the Daily Telegraph. And you can see in that dog dispenser there's a black bag. That was the first type of compostable bag that we tried. So it's nothing wrong with it, but it was just, you know, the worms weren't strong enough to get through it. Um, in 2019, we won the Keep New South Wales Beautiful Sustainable Cities Recycling Organics Award uh, for this project. We were nominated for phase two in 2021. Unfortunately, we didn't make the cut this year, but obviously, you know, there are other programs that are really wonderful and we need to give everybody a chance to showcase their programs. And yeah, people are, it's, it's one of our real feel good projects where people are really, really happy and we get to see a lot of adorable dogs as well, which is great. So what are we looking at next? At this stage of the project, because our focus was on do these work and does the community want them and use them, um, we haven't actually quantified the success. We know it was, we're getting a lot of dog poo, more than we could handle in phase one, but we don't know exactly how much we were getting. So we're looking in the future at putting motion sensors or clickers on the lids of the sub pods so we can see how often they're opened and that will give us an idea about how frequently they're used. We're looking at more promotion to address that contamination issue, but because these subpods don't look like a bin, there could, uh, there could be owners in the park that don't realise it's a dog poo recycling system either. So they're still putting their stuff in the red bin. It's not shown in this photo, but next to every subpod and every phase one, bin, um, phase one bin, there's a garbage bin and there's a dispenser. So people, we'd rather people put their dog poo in the red bin than put the wrong things in the subpods. We're looking at potentially putting QR codes, now everybody's really used to using them, on the signs, and that can actually link people to education materials. It'll send them to a website where it tells them more about the program and what we've got planned. We are looking at shade sales for the subpods. One of the reasons why we think some of the subpods are drying out a bit and the worms aren't very happy about that is because some of them are in direct sunlight. If we had a shade sale, and sometimes we can't put them in the shade because there's just not an appropriate place in the park to put them or it's not near the dispenser in the garbage bin. So if we had some sort of shade sales, they love the, I think they love darker weather anyway, and it will mean that we don't have to do as much watering. 
Um, we're not quite sure of the, um, how much of an issue this is going to be, but we were concerned that for some of the subpods that are actually in direct sunlight, um, the handles could get a little bit hot sometimes. If that, my, my office is keeping an eye on that, and if that becomes a significant problem we can put some sort of insulating material on top of the handle so that they're not as hot to touch and we're going to continue to observe the worm health and poo dump competition and see if there's anything we can do to maximize um, the process so that we're processing as much dump poo as possible we still don't know because it's early stages and we haven't done a aggressive education campaign yet whether we can keep up with the quantity because like I said there might be people that don't even know the sub pods are there yet and don't know that they can use them. So thank you very much it's a project we're very excited about it's um, a great honour to be able to speak to your network and people that are so obviously enthusiastic about waste minimisation and um, pet waste minimisation as well. Um, feel free to ask any questions and there's my contact details if you'd like to um, ask me about something at a later stage. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. I know we're going to be on a tight time frame for questions. So what I want to do is let people know that we'll be meeting again on the Thursday, on the third Thursday of February, and we will revisit uh, some of the contents of this meeting then. And we'll also attempt to collect information from questions that you've posed. And if it's suitable, we will look at emailing out some answers as well. Um, but we will have time for probably a couple of questions. So if someone wants to jump in. So I'm looking at some of the questions here. Vanessa, what brands of bags have worked well? Um, I haven't got that in front of me, but if Ruth, um, I can pass that information on to Ruth and she can distribute it to the team. Um, yeah, it is a bit of trial and error. I think that we only tried to, so there could be lots of other brands that are working as well. Um, but I can definitely tell you those two. Have you found the worms um, can chew through the bio bags to get to the poo? Um, we can't really tell at this stage of the bags at the stage of the trial if it's that the worms are eating through the bags or it's that the bags are decomposing quick enough that they break open naturally and then the worms get to the poo. So we know from other studies and from um, what my officer has done at home that they can eat dog poo. We're not sure about the bags or if it's just that they're decomposing and then they get to their food source anyway. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, can the, Joe, can subbots be sunk into the ground? I don't think they're actually intended for that purpose. I think that the garden bed you saw around them is part of the whole setup. It's, you don't just buy the pods individually. Um, but, um, that's something, if you Google subpod, they've got, a, they've got videos and all sorts of information on their commercial website where you should be able to find more about what you can do because they are designed for home use. So if that's what you mainly wanted to use them for. Um, yeah, we've actually found that the ones that are actually embedded in the ground, which is phase one, can cause problems of their own. Uh, there's been a couple of um, parks that have actually gone through a renovation period and tried to get one of those... Um, those bins out of the ground when it's full of dog poo and soil and worms is a very, very painful process. Um, so the fact that these are kind of like self-contained, it would actually be easier to shift them around than it, than it is with phase one. Um, have there been any cost savings in emptying landfill bins? Um, I think if you look at the council's entire waste system is tens of thousands of tonnes of waste per year. So the amount of waste that we're capturing in this program on its own probably isn't significant on a statistical level. What we're hoping is that by showing that these, these work and how they work, that we'll be encouraging more people to use them at home. That's something that um, we haven't anticipated how we're going to quantify at this stage. We could do surveys online, talk to um, networks such as yourselves, ask people to give us information or feedback if they use these systems. 
Um, but I think that the non-quantifiable component, which is people using them at home, is going to be larger. It's also with in terms of an overall education strategy. When you get people to think outside the box about how to reduce one-way stream, it carries on in their thinking to other areas of their lives. So we kind of create that mindset that you don't have to consider everything as a rubbish. And hopefully that will help with other programs that we're running. Patricia, we might leave it there because we are going oh. to uh, run out of time and I'm going to now turn the recording.